We always understood that this was the wrong material for submersible hulls because with each pressure cycle, you can have progressive damage because you may have a number of successful dives, which is what happened here, and then have it fail later. From the depths of man's insatiable appetite to explore uncharted territory, meet the Titan Submersible, an innovative deep-sea explorer manned to explore the mysteries of the Titanic. Doomed by its own design, it imploded in the ocean depths, taking all aboard with it. But why? Get ready to explore the questionable design choices that made things awry. Venturing into ocean depths in submersibles is far from a new concept. For years, mankind has plunged to unravel the secrets of the dark world. In 2012, Canadian filmmaker James Cameron had a spellbinding expedition to the deepest known point on Earth, the Mariana Trench, using the Deep Sea Challenger submersible. Down he went, bringing up not only data but also actual footage up to 10,900 meters. His deep sea expeditions do not stop there. Before his awe-inspiring dive, he had already paid multiple visits to the Titanic wreck, a feat the Titan submersible was primed to accomplish. Now here is where the plot thickens. In 2021, Victor Vescovo, an American explorer and private investor, made history along with the late billionaire Hamish Harding, yup, the same Harding who was on the Titan submersible for setting a new world record for the longest time spent on a single dive in the Mariana Trench. For four hours and 15 minutes, they navigated depths of 11,000 meters or 36,000 feet below the ocean's surface, pushing the limits of exploration like never before. With such impressive feats as reference, we must eliminate the idea of the Titan imploding due to the ocean depths. The true villain is much darker, far more than the 3,500 meters below sea level it got to when contact was lost. The first rule of a submersible is simple do not implode. The second is to reach the surface with enough oxygen to spare. The third is for occupants to open the hatch without any hitches while resurfacing, and of course being easy to find in case help is required. Sounds easy, right? Despite what submersibles are, transporting people during deep sea expeditions is arguably the easiest part. With meticulous planning and a keen eye for every detail, submersibles have proven to be one of the safest means of transportation, despite the unforgiving nature of an ocean. As a matter of fact, until the infamous implosion of the Titan, no one had ever died while riding or piloting a submersible into the abyss. This extraordinary safety record has stood for nearly a century despite explorers making thousands of dives. So why was the Titan any different? Right now, there is nothing definite. Federal investigators say it could take up to 18 months to determine why the Titan imploded, but according to several engineering experts, the Ocean Gate disaster was far from a surprise. Matter of fact, it was a disaster waiting to happen. For over five years, they had been screaming about the Titan's design flaws, and when that wasn't working, filed complaints to the U.S. government as well as Ocean Gate, pleading its CEO Stockton Rush puts a halt to his lofty ambitions all to no avail. Let's get the whole picture. You see, Rush had grand visions for the Titan. He imagined it as a groundbreaking opportunity for eager explorers to explore the Titanic's wreckage, a cool 12,500 feet below the ocean's surface, for a not-so-small fee of $250,000. Stockton Rush touted himself as a maverick, a man who refused to be held down by the rules. He was so far out on the visionary curve that, for him, safety regulations were mere suggestions. If you're not breaking things, you're not innovating, he declared at the 2022 GeekWire Summit. He saw himself as a true visionary with big dreams of making the Titan's unique design the new industry standard. Taking a significant leap, OceanGate decided to shake things up with a design that had never been used before. Their aim? Trim down the expensive overhead of other submersibles. First things first, the Titan was lightweight, not heavy. The benefit of this was that the craft wouldn't require a dedicated mothership. Proud of the prospects, OceanGate boasted the Titan would be more financially viable than its competitors. Speaking of competitors, most submersibles have a spherical hull, which is scientifically proven to be better at handling the huge pressures of the deep sea. 
Given the Titan was supposed to dive over 12,000 feet beneath the ocean's surface, you'd think Ocean Gate would be more pragmatic, right? The five-person cylindrical pressure hull of the Titan had every engineering buff watching in utter disbelief. Compared to the Alvin, a U.S. government research sub with over 4,500 successful total dives since 1973, the Titan's unorthodox shape allowed it to fit more passengers, making a more profitable journey. Nevertheless, when lives are at stake, are such perks even worth it? Remember when we said the first rule of submersibles is to not implode? Yeah, submersibles must be able to withstand the brutal, unforgiving, crushing pressures of ocean depths, which, by the way, squeeze with equal force from all sides. With the Titanic's depth in mind, every square inch of a submersible experiences three tons of force. We can't emphasize enough on the fact that spheres are the best shape for a submersible's hull. It distributes the stress caused by the compressive forces of the abyss evenly. Any other shape, including Titan's cylindrical design, distributes pressure disproportionately and risks being unevenly deformed. A recipe for disaster. Picture a can of your favorite drink being crushed under the weight of a car. When a submersible is shaped like a pill, the worst is suddenly all the more likely. To make things worse, the 22-foot-long, 23,000-pound Titan's larger internal volume, while still cramped with a maximum of five crew members, meant it was subjected to far more external pressure. In truth, extending the cabin space in a submersible increases pressure loads in the midsections, which in turn increases fatigue and delamination loads. As things stand, there is hardly any reason not to believe the change in hull geometry from a tight sphere to a lengthy tube was a major contributor to the Titan's failure. A larger hull needs to be stronger and thicker to withstand the same pressure as a smaller one. If you place two hulls of the same thickness deep into the ocean, the former would collapse first. Starting to see the bigger picture? There's more. Before its final voyage, the Titan already had about two dozen dives to its name, each giving an ample amount of stress on the hulls, were dished out. While the tiny cracks in the hull's structure must have been undetectable, to the eyes at least, it was like a ticking time bomb, ready to blow. The fact Ocean Gate created most of Titan's hull out of carbon fiber didn't help either. For the uninitiated, carbon fiber is a material commonly used in the aerospace industry because it's strong and lightweight. Unlike the Titan, deep-sea vessels like the Alvin have their hulls crafted using titanium. Why? Because it holds itself well against both tension and compression, essentially meaning it can withstand forces that intend to either pull it apart or crush it. Carbon fiber, on the other hand, is much more effective in resisting pulling forces than crushing forces, such as compression. Remember Ocean Gate's philosophy of being more financially viable than its competitors? Yeah, while titanium is stronger than carbon fiber, it is also more expensive. It is also worth adding that the use of carbon fiber reduced the Titan's weight to 21,000 pounds, compared with Alvin's 45,000 pound mass. The weight reduction allowed the Titan to carry a greater payload than the Titan. The drawback, though, is that carbon fiber is difficult to predict. It doesn't even tend to handle pressure well. It resists pulling for a while before breaking, but collapses or buckles if pushed on or compressed. All the more reason to question the firm's choice. Instead of doing the right thing, OceanGate promoted the Titan's carbon fiber construction with titanium end caps as lighter in weight and more efficient to mobilize than other deep diving submersibles. It also said the vessel was designed to be 4 kilometers or 2.4 miles with a comfortable safety margin according to court documents. Moving on, did you know Stockton Rush rented a mothership that was smaller, older, and cheaper than the ships used on previous expeditions? Dubbed the Polar Prince, the ship was too small and cramped to judiciously lift the Titan on its deck. As a solution, the Titan had to be towed by the Polar Prince during its three-day voyage from St. John's S. Newfoundland to the Titanic site. Funny enough, this raised some eyebrows earlier. In particular, Arnie Weissman, editor-in-chief of Travel Weekly, opined the sub and platform were being tossed around pretty roughly. With concerns mounting on the Titan's conveyance, the million-dollar question regarding the plausible damage caused by tossing the Titan was finally asked. A sheepish answer was given, Ocean Gate is unable to provide any additional information at this time. 
Yet another controversial topic of the Titan was the fact it was designed in a way that its carbon fiber shell had to be glued to titanium rings on either end. Because of this, there were joints between the different materials, joints that were particularly tricky to seal properly. From patterns to rates, all materials have a different way of changing shape when under pressure. Getting a cohesive way to achieve and maintain a seal for the carbon fiber and titanium was a challenge. As if that wasn't enough, several engineers also showed concerns over what impact joining different materials in the Titan would have on its water tightness. As stated earlier, the Titan would have been subject to water pressures of three tons of force per square inch at titanic depths. Under such depths, the carbon fiber would compress in diameter quicker than the titanium, placing significant stress on the glue joint. Additionally, sea salt or moisture could have degraded the hull's carbon fiber and the glue joining it to the titanium. You don't need to be an engineering guru to deduce that outcome would have created another potential weak point in the submersible. Tim Foka, a retired forensic metallurgist who has done mechanical testing and failure analysis on metals and carbon fiber, also believed uneven tightening of the hatch bolts might cause uneven stress along the porthole, causing a fracture. The issues kept piling up, and it certainly did not stop there. As you probably already know, most deep-sea craft undergo rounds of tests and inspections by external but reputable marine organizations specializing in the necessary engineering and safety studies before certifying the craft as safe. Alas, Stockton Rush wasn't even remotely interested in obtaining a certification for Titan, insisting it goes against their goals and belief. According to a since-deleted blog post by Titan's creators titled, Why Titan is Not Classed, the blog claimed the entire process of certifying the Titan submersible would have been too voluminous and exhausting as continually bringing an outside entity up to speed on every innovative concept before it is then put into real-world testing destroys the essence of rapid innovation. In light of this, we can't help but remember CEO Stockton Rush's statement in a documentary. You are remembered for the rules you break, and I've broken some rules to make this. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. Granted, getting a submersible certification is an optional process, and Rush wasn't legally required to get one, but it is an unspoken necessity. Besides, having a submersible class means it satisfies all the performance, safety, stability, and strength standards. If the Titan got certified, we cannot help but feel the issues that plagued it would have been worked on and checkmated. Hear this. David Lockridge, then Director of Marine Operations at OceanGate, said in a 2018 lawsuit that the company's testing and certification were insufficient and would subject passengers to potential extreme danger in an experimental submersible. To solve this, he pleaded for non-destructive testing, such as ultrasonic scans that could help spot areas inside the structure where the composites are coming apart. But surprisingly, the company refused. Before the Titan made its infamous final voyage to the Titanic's wreckage, the Marine Technology Society, an organization of ocean engineers, educators, technologists, and policymakers, expressed a couple of concerns over a lot of things they felt were left wanting. From the size of the Titan to the material chosen by OceanGate, and of course, the fact that its prototype did not undergo any critical examination by a third-party organization, eyebrows were raised. No matter how you look at it, they were right. OceanGate slacked in several areas. Descending into the ocean's abyssal zone, and we mean the waters from 10,000 to 20,000 feet, is a serious affair and should never be compromised. Ask around. The chaotic pressures at such depths are far more challenging than taking a voyage into space. For a submersible to dive into such realms, a series of never-ending tests are mandatory. Every component that makes up the craft has to be checked for flaws in a pressure chamber and thoroughly checked again, preferably by an external organization free from bias. OceanGate's excuse was laughable. Rapid innovation means nothing if it fails. The first mistake the firm made was being too engrossed in its philosophy of cutting costs and being more economically viable than its competitors. Using carbon fiber material, an unorthodox material, for deep-sea submersibles wasn't the smartest of choices. The best submersibles need to be crafted with the strongest and most predictable materials as determined by the laws of physics. How could they fail to consider the overwhelmingly obvious downsides despite being warned? 
And again, the pill-like pressure hull was another blunder. The pressure hull needed to be formed into a perfect sphere, the only shape gifted with the ability to distribute pressure symmetrically. If the weight of the titanium was too big of a con for Ocean Gate, why couldn't they add crush-resistant syntactic foam around a spherical hull to improve buoyancy and protection? To dive over 12,000 feet below the ocean's surface, contingency upon contingency must be put in place with no room for failure. From safety plans to rescue plans in case things go bad, every detail has to be inch-perfect. If only Ocean Gate had a bit more respect for the forces in the deep ocean, perhaps they would have been more pragmatic. If they were, who knows? All five people on board would be alive today. The wrecks of the Titanic and the Titan sit on the ocean floor, separated by 1,600 feet and 111 years of history. While it was likely painless, the implosion was so turbulent and comprehensive that we may never know the precise cause of the disaster, a disaster that could have been avoided. With everything that has been said and done, we're almost itching to get your unfiltered takes about Ocean Gate's infamous Titan submersible. Regarding their need to be lighter and cost-friendly, what do you think about the firm's design choices? Do you believe their decisions were the reason why the Titan failed? We'd love to hear your thoughts on this in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and like always. With that said, thanks for watching and until next time.